Okay, we were talking about the uh, various influences on Plato and uh, how he constructed his philosophical system on the basis of these various eclectic influences. I told you that eclectic is a word that shows different things, but you must understand that something can be different but similar. But when you use the word eclectic, it basically means that it is also dissimilar, not just similar. Okay, now let us look into Plato's epistemology. I told you epistemology is the pursuit of knowledge and uh, there are myriad influences on Plato. That's why I'm using the word eclectic. There is Socrates, there is Parmenides, then um, there is Zeno, then there is Protagoras and uh, there is also uh, the influence of the Periclean oration. So the last time I was speaking to you, I was speaking to you about Pythagoras. We finished the influence of Pythagoras and mathematics upon Plato's philosophical system. I was trying to tell you that Plato's philosophy is primarily an ethical, moral philosophy. And uh, the drawing of this ethical moral philosophy for him is from geometry and symmetry within geometry. We'll talk about that in a minute. But before that, I want to draw your attention to the fact that Plato is somebody who believed in the primacy of ethics, even though we study him as a political philosopher. Now, let me quickly talk you through ethics and morality. For the Greeks, ethics and morality meant the same thing, just as science and philosophy meant the same thing for them. But if you see uh, the modern world, I was talking to you the other day about binaries. And because of the binaries, what has happened is, Ethics has got separated 
from morality. This is a phenomenon that happened in the early modern period, but it culminated properly in the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant makes a distinction between ethics and morals. For him, ethics are derived from ethics are basically derived from uh, what should I say from uh, uh, from the social ethos in which one exists but morals are transcendental they are transcendental in the sense that they are untouched or cannot be touched by either time or by space. So what that basically means is that morality is transcendental. And when we talk about the word transcendental, what we actually mean is that morality transcends, meaning it is above time and space. It is not affected either by time or by space. And that basically means that, uh, you know, uh, that essentially means that uh, these are categories that are non-negotiable. You cannot negotiate on morality but you can negotiate on ethics in the modern period, not for the Greeks. So let me, instead of going on talking about this in the abstract, let me give you a concrete example. A concrete example of this, uh, social ethos derived ethics is how different cultures at the same time uh, basically have different value systems. They have different value systems. So, if you take the case of, uh, if you take the case of uh, what happens, say, with certain social practices around the same time, that will show that what is ethical for some is not ethical for others. So let me illustrate this with an example. The example that I'd like to give you is that in India, especially in South India and among Muslims, there is a great deal of what 
we call incest. Incest is marriages within a family. Now, those of you who have been bred on Telugu films will know this whole thing about Bava. Okay, so what is Bava? Bava is nothing but your mother's brother's son. Okay, mother's brother's son, you can marry them, right? But you cannot marry your father's brother's daughter or son. It's a funny thing. Okay, just as much as there is a sharing of a blood relationship between people in the father's side, father's brother's daughter is not dissimilar from mother's brother's daughter. Yet, in terms of our social ethos, marriages to a mother's brother's daughter are allowed. But marriages to father's brother's daughter are not allowed. Okay, so that is uh, that is basically what is incest. Marriages within the family, within the same bloodline. Right? Now, this is something that is acceptable in all the five southern states. It is also acceptable in some of the North Indian states. They also have different forms of incest. But if you look at, if an American looks at this, the American is shocked. He says, how can you marry within your own community? within your own family. So that for them is something which is unacceptable. Okay, they find that completely unacceptable. We don't find it acceptable. I mean, we find it acceptable, but they don't. Now, among the Muslims, you can marry your father's brother's daughter. You can also marry your mother's sister's daughter. Okay. So, that is their social ethos. All these things will shock the Western mind because in their social ethos, 
this thing doesn't exist. And the Western mind is typically amused by the fact that we have uh, arranged marriages. The Western mind believes that you have to search for your own life partner. Life partner in the West basically means somebody who's your life partner for two years. After that, you'll get divorced anyway. My favorite musician is on to his fifth wife now. Okay, but I don't care about his personal life. He's a great lyricist, he's a great music writer. So, but he's on to his fifth wife. This is something that we can't accept. Okay, even though divorce rates are growing in India, the idea that you'll marry four times, five times, is still not acceptable. Similarly, when it comes to premarital sex, premarital sex is a very known thing in Europe and America. It is acceptable. It is absolutely acceptable. Nobody considers that to be a sin. But when it comes to us, we don't accept. We don't accept the uh, whole idea of premarital sex. For us, that is a violation of ethics. So you see, ethics are those which vary in time and in space. What I have given you now are examples in space. But if you see the uh, ancient Greek civilization, fornication between brother and even Romans, if you've seen the movie Gladiator, it's very so very obvious in it. Fornication between brother and sister is perfectly acceptable. If you look at the ancient Egyptian civilizations, in the Egyptian civilizations, it is a rule. Okay? It is a rule to get married to your own sister. It's not a choice. It's a rule. That was never acceptable to people in this part of the world. So, ethos is something that changes, and along with the change in the ethos, you have change in its derivative, which is ethics. But the Greeks didn't see it this way. They saw it just as we see morality today. What we find is that ethics are negotiable. Ethics are perfectly negotiable, but Morality, since it is transcendental, since it is not affected by time, by place, by 
a certain civilization, a social ethos. It's a transcendental category. And therefore, what is moral is moral always. And what is not moral is also not moral always. So, by the time we come to the modern period, you see that there is this disjunction between ethics and morality. No longer do we use them uh, as, you know, one in place of the other. You can't substitute the word morality with ethics, or similarly, ethics with morality. You cannot do that anymore. So, please remember that when we're talking about the Greek notion of ethics, it corresponds to our present notion of morality and not to our present notion of ethics. So the Greek ethic is a transcendental category. It will become obvious to you as I go deeper into Plato's philosophy and also as we go into Aristotle. So to avoid confusion, I will not use the term ethics. I will use the term moral and morality to describe the core of the philosophy of Plato. Plato's philosophy is moral. It is a moral system and it is in his case, if you ask Kant, for example, what is the source of morality? The source of morality, according to Kant, is faith. Because he says, where reason ends, faith begins. But when you look at Plato, and when you look at his moral system, what we are seeing in Plato is primarily, primarily a moral system. So Plato's philosophy should be described as moral philosophy, but it is not taken from abstract principles, it is rationally derived. That is what makes Plato great. In my introductory remarks to Plato, I had told you that Plato is a very, very advanced thinker for his time. Plato thought about and did things which people couldn't imagine in his own time. So Plato, in that sense, is an extremely radical philosopher. And therefore, I think what Professor Alan Whitehead 
uh, who's also considered to be a philosopher in his own right, he said all Western philosophy is a footnote to Plato. So you cannot talk about Western philosophy without in some sense or the other invoking Plato. That is the importance that Plato has. So you see that his system is most interesting and intriguing is not a given, his moral system, but it is something that is derived rationally. And that that's what makes him an amazing man for his own time. So, this is one of the things that you need to remember. That he derived his morality from geometry and symmetry. The next influence that is there on Plato is the influence of Pericles, P E R I C L E S. Pericles was the leader of the Athenians in their war against Sparta. In the war against Sparta, which lasted 18 years, you will see that uh, the Athenians were finally no match for the Spartans. This particular war between Sparta and Athens is called the Peloponnesian War because it was fought in this place called Peloponnesi. It was in that particular place that they fought this war. So it's called the Peloponnesian War. And when Athens was defeated, then you see that there is a great deal of introspection on the part of Pericles. He was the leader of the Athenians, all said and done. And it is a leader who basically has to give answers to why something went wrong. So, you will see that there is this attempt on the part of Pericles to try and explain why the Spartans ultimately proved to be superior to the Athenians and why they managed to defeat the Athenians. So this is a very long speech that Pericles gave and it is popularly called the Periclean Oration. The Periclean oration also had an immense 
influence on Plato. Now, normally, we would think that, uh, you know, uh, normally we would think that uh, those who talk about the mind and the body, they do so as dualism, which is what you find in René Descartes. René Descartes basically believed in the mind, the superiority of the mind, and uh, he believed that it was the body was nothing. He believed that the body and the mind could exist independently of each other. You could have a mind that exists on its own. You could have a body that exists on its own without a mind and a mind without a body. But René Descartes says that a mind can know of its existence. Because thought, which is the primary language, is something which is sitting in the mind. So the mind, even if it doesn't have a body, can still think of its own self. It can exist by being conscious of itself. Whereas the body as such can exist without the mind, but it doesn't know that it exists because the function of thought or cognition is that of the mind, not that of the body. So this is actually called the mind-body dualism. We will talk about this when we come to the modern period. But I thought it relevant to mention here so that you don't get confused between this kind of dualism and what Plato says about the mind and the body. For Plato, obviously, the mind is the one that informs people about who they are, what they are, how they are. All those things are those that are there in the mind. Nevertheless, unlike René Descartes, who says the body is not important, you find there is an emphasis on the body in Plato. Despite the fact, cognition, thought, language, all these being performed by the mind, he still attaches tremendous importance to the body. Because for him, the mind sits in the body. And when he heard the Periclean oration, one of the things that Pericles had said was that the Athenians got used to a lazy and decadent lifestyle. Because they got used to a lazy and decadent lifestyle, 
these people lost the war to the Spartans. That is one of the important points that is made in the Periclean oration. Now, if you look at Plato, Plato places great emphasis on the body and on physical fitness. So, in Plato, while the mind is the most important thing, the body is not unimportant. The body is equally important. So Plato, therefore, talks about the necessity for physical fitness. So you see, when we read the Republic, there is, uh, there are passages pretty long passages, which talk about the necessity for physical fitness. And that basically is the influence of the Periclean oration. So you see, there are all these different influences and despite all of them being eclectic, despite all of them being eclectic, you will see that, you will actually realize that Plato constructs his own body of thought in which there are no contradictions between these eclectic influences, between these eclectic influences, there is no contradiction. That again is what makes Plato an extremely important philosopher. I'll stop here today. I'll see you tomorrow. This week, we will have online classes. From Monday onwards, let us see if we can have classes offline. But this week, we shall have online classes. Uh, and like I said, uh, evening classes will begin on Monday because I've been asked not to stress myself too much. So with your permission, we'll start on Monday and uh, the evening classes. Those will be online. Uh, let's keep a rain check. Depending upon how things are, we probably can try and move to offline classes in uh, the morning for Western political uh, uh, thought. Thank you very much. I shall see you tomorrow. Thank you, Ishwar.